Hello, everyone, and welcome to this Sunday sermon preview. I'm David Fullen, the pastor of the Drakesboro and Jurgens Chapel, United Methodist Churches, and I'm pleased to welcome you for this little preview of our sermon today. Uh, it may not be possible for us to have the live feed, so I wanted this to be available just in case you have problems with the live feed or in case there's none at all. Uh, I'd like you to be able to have this. Uh, we're going to uh, begin with a word of prayer and then we'll open our Bibles to Mark chapter 9. Let's pray. Holy Father, we thank you. We thank you for allowing us to gather together here in your name. We thank you for giving us Jesus through whom all these blessings have come. We ask you now, Father, to open our eyes to the scriptures and to the truth that you would like to share with us. We ask it in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Let's uh, take a look at Mark 9, verses 14 through 32. That'll be our starting place. The title of the sermon is Believing and Not Believing. How can it be both? Believing and not believing. Um, <clears throat> last week, Peter, James, and John were coming down the mountain where they had seen Jesus transfigured and talking with Moses and Elijah. And the verse 14 begins, and when they came to the disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and scribes disputing with them. All of a sudden, when the whole crowd saw him, they were amazed and ran to greet him. Then he asked them, what are you arguing with them about? Out of the crowd, one man answered him, teacher, I brought my son to you. He has a spirit that makes him unable to speak. Wherever it seizes him, it throws him down. And he foams at the mouth, grinds his teeth, and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to drive it out, but they couldn't. He replied to them, you unbelieving generation, how long will I be with you? How long must I put up with you? Bring him to me. So they brought him to him. When the spirit saw him, when the spirit saw him, it immediately convulsed the boy. He fell to the ground and rolled around foaming at the mouth. How long has this been happening to him? Jesus asked his father. From childhood, he said. And many times it has thrown him into fire or water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Then Jesus said to him, if you can, everything is possible to the one who believes. Immediately, the father of the boy cried out, I do believe, help my unbelief. When Jesus saw that a crowd was rapidly coming together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, you mute and deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. Then it came out, shrieking and convulsing him violently the boy became like a corpse, so that many said, he's dead. But Jesus, taking him by the hand, raised him, and he stood up. After he went into the, a house, his disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we drive it out? And he told them, this kind can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. Then they left that place and made their way through Galilee 
but he did not want anyone to know it. For he was teaching his disciples and telling them, the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of men. They will kill him, and after he is killed, he will rise three days later. But they did not understand this statement, and they were afraid to ask him. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. It seems like the crowd is always waiting after each crossing of the lake and now as they descend from the mountaintop experience with Moses and Elijah. The moment they recognize Jesus, they run toward him in amazement. There has been an argument with a group of scribes at the foot of the mountain, but Mark never tells us what that argument was about. The apparent answer comes from a frustrated and frightened father. He has brought his demon-possessed son to Jesus for healing, discovering that Jesus was not there, but on the mountain. He begged the disciples to exorcise the demon. They failed. In Mark 9, 19, we see Jesus at one of his most emotional moments in this gospel. If we are to understand these feelings, we need to take into account where Jesus has just been. I wonder if for those few luminous moments on the mountain, Jesus felt the tremendous weight of his human experience mercifully lifted for a time. What greater encouragement than fellowship with Moses and Elijah and hearing the voice of his father declaring his love. On the way down the mountain, he has experienced a substantial and engaging discussion after the three disciples learned to ask better questions or began to ask better questions. After these satisfying moments, Jesus appears on the scene only to hear bickering and to witness the failure of his disciples to do something they learned to do earlier on their first mission trip. As we will see in the verses that follow, the deep source of his frustration is their unbelief. As the boy is brought, the demon throws him into a final convulsion in one last attempt to destroy him. The father's response to Jesus's question affirms this. From childhood, it has been trying to kill him. The father has no idea what buttons he's pushing in Jesus when he asks, if you can do anything, I imagine Jesus turning from the boy writhing on the ground and facing the father squarely. If you can, he responds. The pressure of the situation leads to new clarity. The father blurts out, I do believe, help my unbelief. As contradictory as these words might seem, the pressure of the life and death situation brings into focus deep truths. In the tangle of the human heart, we sometimes do believe and not believe in the same moment. That is, until something or someone appears to help us with our unbelief. The ever-present crowd is running to the scene. Jesus senses that he has only a few seconds to do what he needs to do. He issues the authoritative command and the demon has no choice but to obey. Perhaps the demon does finally kill the boy in the process and those who think he is dead are right. Nevertheless, Jesus takes the boy's hand and raises him up. Afterward, they enter a house of undisclosed location. In a private moment, the embarrassed disciples ask why they failed. Jesus 
implying that the that there are different kinds of demons says this particular kind is only overcome by prayer and listen to this new definition of prayer to pray is to totally give the situation over to god allowing his power to redeem the situation the disciples were trying to cast out the demon in their own power instead they need to learn to completely depend on god's power working through them jesus confesses that even he cannot do i believe it's phrased differently even he can do nothing without the father and as they secretly pass through Galilee on their way back to Capernaum, Jesus spends more focused time instructing the disciples. He presses the point. He is going to be killed but raised to life on the third day. In a priceless insight, Mark tells us the disciples still do not understand and then to top it all off, he tells us they were afraid to ask him. That's chapter 9, verse 32. There are some observations that I know you've made as we have, have read through and talked through the scriptures. I certainly want to encourage you in the way that Jesus encouraged the man where he said to him, uh, uh, oh, there it is, verse 23. If he, he, said to, he said to the man, everything is possible to the one who believes. Everything is possible to the one who believes. The angel Gabriel said to Mary when he brought her news of the son she was going to bear, she said, or he said to her, with God, all things are possible. And so I want to encourage you to bring your needs to him today. Every illness, every pain, and in prayer, I want to use this new definition of prayer, to pray. To pray is to totally give the situation over to God, allowing his power to redeem the situation. Totally give the situation over to God. I know from my own experiences in prayer that it can be the most liberating experience. Talk about weight being lifted off your shoulders. Sometimes it's difficult to allow your prayer request to stay with God. Sometimes you want to pick it up again. But if you'll resist that by simply going to him in prayer and and remembering the things that you have already committed to him. Then there's that lesson that the disciples teach us about working in our own power and in our own strength. And we are conditioned in this world to do everything in our own self-sufficiency. And God is teaching us Jesus is teaching us to depend on him, to trade in our stubborn self-sufficiency for dependence on him. And so, brothers and sisters, I encourage you to learn to completely depend on God's power working through you. Be so committed to that task and so comfortable in it that God can do this work in you and through you. Take to heart Jesus's knowledge that even he 
can do nothing without the Father. So announce your dependence upon him. Follow him closely. Stay very close. And the way we can stay close is by reading and meditating on his word. Take it from here and go forward and go backward in the Gospel of Mark. Look for those lessons that Mark is teaching. Allow those lessons to make their mark on you. And don't be afraid to ask Jesus anything. That's another one of those amazing statements. Mark tells us the disciples still do not understand what Jesus is telling them about his brutal crucifixion and resurrection. They were afraid to ask him. Let us not be afraid to bring any need, to ask any question, to ask again and again as it would assist us in living our lives for Christ. Thank you so much for spending this time with me. I appreciate your help in all of the things that we are about in Christ. Thank you again. May God bless you and keep you until we meet again. Bye.